Okay, I'd like to bring this meeting back to order. We'll now go on to our final committee, which is Committee of the Whole. Um, we'll do things a little bit differently today because our fourth item is a work session on the proposed 2017-2018 uh, biennial budget changes. And we're going to hold that work session following a usual practice in the mayor's boardroom. So it's going to be kind of odd. We're going to take most of our business and then we're going to go to the mayor's boardroom and we usually then uh, take a recess to the mayor's boardroom for executive sessions. So when we leave here, we're sort of in a sense going to go for both of those items at the end of the meeting and we'll finish up all the regular business before those two items before we do that. So going on to the first item, the first item before the Committee of the Whole is an ordinance prohibiting feeding of deer and raccoons within the city of Bellingham. Many wild animals have adopted, adapted sorry, to urban environments and are experiencing steady increases in population. However, intentional feeding of wildlife supports additional population growth and further concentrates animals in small areas, hastening the spread of disease in animal populations, increasing the risk of animal deaths in traffic, and increasing human-animal conflicts. The feeding of wild animals by humans can also adversely affect the animal's health. Uh, the City Council has received a number of complaints from residents about problems created by feeding wild animals, a number of different kinds of animals, but particularly focusing on deer. The attached ordinance would prohibit the feeding of the intentional feeding of deer or raccoons within the city limits of Bellingham. Our policy analyst, Mark Gardner, is here to give a few introductory remarks. Good afternoon, Council. Mark Gardner, Legislative Analyst. Uh, just wanted to briefly discuss the ordinance in front of you and uh, a few of the provisions. Um, as you know, earlier in the, the year, uh, Council directed staff to bring back an ordinance for consideration that would prohibit feeding of deer and raccoons. The ordinance in the packet prohibits the intentional feeding of deer and raccoons. The intent is to reduce problems resulting from very highly concentrated animal populations resulting from intentional feeding. The, uh, I wanted to mention that the intent is not to starve animals or eliminate animals. The intent is simply to prevent the excessive concentration of animals unnaturally in, in a number of uh, neighborhood areas where they can then uh, over-concentrate and cause it all, uh, additional problems that um, we are, we're getting a number of complaints about. Um, and in, in the ordinance itself, uh, the presence of landscape and gardening plants are not considered intentional feeding. The, which is a good thing. The feeding of domestic pet, pets and livestock is exempted from definition of feeding as well. The ordinance requires the city to provide educational materials to the public to educate them as to why they shouldn't be feeding wild, uh, wild deer and raccoons. Uh, the enforcement language is identical to other language in this same chapter that this ordinance would, would apply to, Chapter 7.2 of the city code. Um, and I want to mention that the enforcement process usually starts with education and a warning. Fines are generally only, only for repeated and willful, willful uh, failures to comply. So even though it looks like there's a fine right away, most of our fines have an educational and a sort of escalation and an intentional willful violation component before they come into effect. So that's just a brief overview of the ordinance itself. And there's also a, a new version of the memo that was in your packet a few uh, weeks ago, which is basically just slightly updated, no new substantive information in that memo. Any questions I can answer? Dan? Sorry, Mr. Smark. Um, mm -hmm. What department would be the enforcement uh, department? Uh, as we've had a little bit of discussion about, there's no resources already at this point identified for enforcement. Uh, the Code Enforcement Compliance Department of the Police Department felt that they were um, oversubscribed for direct enforcement. Um, the Humane Society uh, also feels like their contract is a little bit overextended. Uh, we have received communication from Department of Fish and Wildlife that they do actively respond to calls in the city of Bellingham. They get six to eight calls per year. They will generally talk to the person who makes the call. They will ask them to educate their neighbors as to why they shouldn't be feeding wildlife. If it persists, they will come and attempt to educate that person either through literature or through face-to-face -face interaction. Um, so there is a direct response, but 
they would not take the, the next step to directly enforce if there was a need for a fine. Um, and they also, uh, at DFW, told me that some cities will phase this in, start with an educational period, and then only later would they start enforcement. So the reality is that we don't have uh, a, a department or entity identified to do the fining of people at this point, but DFW will respond, and both the Humane Society and the DFW have uh, indicated they would help with the education component as well. So that's where we stand with this. April? Um, we do have a representative from the Humane Society here, and we got a letter specifically not endorsing this um, particular resolution, I guess it is. Can, would, would, would you all humor me in maybe having um, Laura come to the stand and explain why the Humane Society, they're a pretty trusted organization in the community. I'd like to hear a little bit more exactly why. I believe the information they sent us was just about capacity, not that they disagreed with the ordinance, but that they don't have the capacity for enforcement, okay. if I understood all our notes correctly. I guess I'm asking if she can come forward and, and specifically say why they don't endorse the ordinance. I don't have a problem with it. Okay. Um, we I have, have no, two minutes. I just okay. want, I want to understand better. We have received several letters from the Humane Society, but if there's no objection, we can have that, that sentiment re-expressed yes. verbally. Yeah. Did you mind? Yes. Either place. <laughs> And just for the record, say your name, please. Good afternoon, Laura Clark, Director of Whatcom Humane Society. Thank you for your time. So um, I don't, I know we've talked about this extensively in, in the communication we've had. So again, the Whatcom Humane Society, we um, respect the intent behind this. Uh, our Wildlife Rehabilitation Center, as I stated in our correspondence, receives thousands of animals every year. Many of them are injured and or harmed due to well-meaning human interaction, including feeding wild animals. We would propose to this council that instead of um, approving this ordinance as it's written with the enforcement aspect, we perhaps take a step back and work over the next six months to a year on an education program, educating the community on why they should not feed native wildlife, not interact with native wildlife, and keep uh, native wildlife safe. And then if that is not being uh, having a positive effect, then perhaps the council could re-examine an ordinance that would include uh, enforcement. So, thank you, Laura. Jean, um, I um, think Laura does a wonderful job at the Humane Society. I want to state that right off the bat, but I vehemently disagree. I think this is an ordinance we've been talking about now for six months. And, and Terry brought it up months ago. It's no different than what we did with fireworks. It's no different than putting up a stop sign or a stoplight. People go through them. Okay? But we try to pick off enough people that respect laws and respect things that they're not supposed to do. So I firmly believe we can do an educational program and pass this ordinance and be able to let people know that it's not right to, to, to feed these animals. We get emails constantly about this, and I get the saddest thing I see is when people send me a picture of a deer that somebody shot an arrow through because it was in their backyard so much. So no, I uh, and I'm going to go ahead and uh, and move approval of the ordinance because I think it's the least we can do to try to get the conversation to a different level to where people will stop feeding these animals. I'll second that. And we have a motion. We have a motion before us to recommend approval of the ordinance uh, as currently written for us tonight for the discussion. Uh, Pinky and then Dan. I want to say that I, I agree with Jean because um, most of the complaints that we get are from people saying that they have talked to people who are feeding the animals, that they've tried to educate them, and it's not a deterrence. So I think that we have to absolutely educate people who maybe don't understand the implications of what are happening, but there has to be a level of, um, of penalty or a cost for doing the actions even though you know you're not supposed to be doing it. And I think that that's where we're at right now is uh, there has to be something that stops people and realizing that they are violating the law. And that's, I think, where we're at. We get so many complaints on this topic, and you guys know because we all get them. 
Um, so I, I think we, we have to have education, but I think we also have to get to a point that there is a place where people can say, this is the law and you are breaking the law. Dan? Who, who does the education on this? Who would, who would do that? As I uh, mentioned a, a minute ago, the uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife said they would respond to, to complaints that they get, and they already do that. And so what they, what they do is they do everything up until enforcing our city law, which they're, of course, not empowered to do because they're a state agency. So that is the piece that they would not directly do. So um, they, they would be willing to help us with education. And I believe the Humane Society it, it would as well. Um, they have limited capacity to do so, perhaps, but uh, they've got the expertise as well. So between those two, uh, and I've already, you know, compiled research that would help with that process if, if necessary. Roxanne? Another thing that our council did was we asked people to stop smoking in parks and to not smoke in parks, and we put up signage, and that doesn't come with too much of a heavy enforcement arm to it. I really want people to know what our values are when we pass these kinds of things, to know what we care about and what we stand with. And to me, I really need the community to understand you're doing harm to our animals and to our species when you invite them into your home, when you can't have them at your home and continually care for them, putting them at risk for our roads and for the safety of everyone. So I'm gonna be supporting this so people understand where my values are, hopefully where the council's very values are, and the work that we have to do to protect species and animals. Terry, I'm, I'm gonna take a turn and then recognize you next. So um, I think the simple fact we can't ignore is that education has not worked. Education alone, and there needs to be a consequence to backstop it. Um, and we're really traveling the well-established path on nuisance ordinances. This is just what cities do. We pass nuisance ordinances when someone's behavior negatively affects the rest of the community or, or individuals in their community, their neighbors. Um, but I've, I've heard repeatedly the emphasis on on education. Um, I know the administration is more comfortable with that. I, I, we've heard that, you know, from the Humane Society as well. Um, I think we can consider um, kind of a, a modified approach, which is that the enforcement aspect might take effect after a period of, say, six months or some period like that, you know, that will allow time for a rollout of an education effort, and then the consequences will hit. We pass the ordinance now, we tell people it's the wrong idea, but you know, it allows for that education component. Maybe we never have to get to the enforcement component. That's the way it works with many of other other ordinances. That once you pass a law, most people comply. In those few headache cases we have now, that's when it would go to that next level. So, if people are worried about giving education time, we can consider delaying the effective date, or we could just have it be effective now and still roll out the education. Either way would work. Terry. Yeah, I, you know, I'm going. I'm going to support this, but I want to echo. Gene's statement that I truly admire the Humane Society. In another lifetime, I worked for a Humane Society in a big city doing animal rescue and other things. And so I know the great work that's being done. But in this case, this has been something that's been discussed for a long time. We know there are certain problems with it. We know we're not going to do heavy duty enforcement of this, but hopefully most people are law abiding and when there's ordinances passed they do comply and 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 I, I agree education should be part of it as well but I will support it April so I'll be the negative Nelly on this one I <clears throat> I, I do believe in what Laura's saying I think that uh, we do need a process to get here and and respectfully completely agree that nobody should be feeding most types of animals and even if you are you should really be extremely well educated and knowing when and where you should be doing that uh, however there's a big problem whenever we start putting so many things on the books and then we're not able to enforce them and people lose uh, the respect in the city uh, whenever they know that there's a rule and they're asking that the rule is enforced and then the city doesn't do it and so uh, I this problem is a really huge problem. I don't disagree, but I agree in the sense of we need to bring a lot more partners to the table and figure out 
to me, it seemed like a lot of the complaints that we were getting are sectioned to certain parts of the city more than other parts of the city. So we know that there's targeted areas that are having worse problems with deer and more aggressive deer. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just think that there could be more people to the table to help us understand how do we look at the long-term implications of urban deer and wildlife in our city. And then, then we can spend our monies appropriately on targeting out how we're going to deal with that. And so I, I think it's a bigger, broader problem. I, I, I think, you know, part of me is just it'd be easier to just pass this ordinance and then, you know, hopefully find a little bit of money for some education. But it's going to be a bigger problem. We're going to get more dense and deer here, and they don't, they don't have anything besides, unfortunately, cars uh, culling the population, which is awful and horrible. So I would just like to take a much broader approach to this. So if we didn't pass it, I certainly do think that we should do something as a committee, maybe ask the mayor to task together a group and try to figure out how are we going to deal with urban wildlife as we densify, because we're going to densify. So I won't be supporting it, but not because I don't want you feeding the wildlife. Dear, oh, yeah. Any further discussion? Okay, the motion before us is to recommend approval of the ordinance tonight to prohibit intentional feeding of deer and raccoons within the city of Bellingham. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Okay, that passes six to one. I'll bring that forward with positive recommendation tonight. The second item is approval of an exemption to the city's living wage requirement for management of Lake Padden Golf Course. Uh, this will have to do with the issue, the def meaning of living wage versus prevailing wage. Uh, the city has issued an RFP request for proposals for the operation of the publicly owned Lake Padden Golf Course and is negotiating with a management company with expertise in operating other municipal golf courses. An exemption to the living wage ordinance is required in this case um, because the required wages under the ordinance would it's likely exceed new. what would be paid at comparable private golf courses in the area. The city council may grant an exception to the requirements of this chapter upon making a written finding that compliance with the living wage will cause economic hardship to the city or its citizens or due to special and unforeseen circumstances. The management company would still be required to comply with state prevailing wage laws, however. So it's just this additional city requirement which would be waived. Uh, we have before us, oh, by the way, this item was added. Um, right after the first time the council packet was publicized, but it was still noticed several days ago. Our Parks Director, Leslie Bryson, is here. Do you want to start? Sure. Leslie Bryson, Parks and Recreation uh, Director. As I uh, summarized in my memo to you, um, the golf course has been run for at least 10 years by Lake Padden LLC. Uh, in recent years, they've had a lease. That lease expires at the end of this year, and they gave us notice uh, several months ago that they were not going to renew that lease. So we put out an RFP and a committee made up of golfers, uh, park board member, and several city staff um, selected Premier Golf as the highest ranked company that we reviewed, and we started discussions with them. and. Um, and this came up recently about the living wage ordinance, that they would be subject to that. Uh, we selected them um, because they have had great success in managing municipal golf courses in Puget Sound. That's all they do. They only manage municipal golf courses. They manage the courses for the city of Seattle, uh, Marysville, Bellevue, Linwood, and Maple Valley. And, in, and I've talked to my counterparts, those are all municipal golf courses, I've talked to the parks directors there, they're very happy with the company, they've really turned things around and uh, the golf courses are, are self-sustaining. And I also pointed out in the memo that um, except for maybe early on when the golf course opened, we have not subsidized the golf course. It's been fully funded by golfers themselves, their fees, and that stays. It's an enterprise fund, and those funds stay in the golf fund, and they're used to take care of the course and make improvements to the course. Um, uh, many of the employees that work at the golf course are, are seasonal. Um, they hire a lot of college kids in the summertime. They have food and beverage workers that also um, make tips, so that's part of their compensation. And um, the requirement to impose the living wage on this, actually this, the city would just 
turn around and be paying that because we will collect all the money, all the revenue from the course, and then we'll turn around and pay the expenses. So it would either mean drastically increasing golf fees, which won't necessarily improve revenue because it could drive golfers away, or the city maybe would be looking at having to subsidize the course. So we're asking for the exemption um, because it's uh, the way that I don't, I'm not sure that the, well, I don't want to talk about what, what the intent of the uh, original ordinance was, but um, at that time we weren't running the golf course like this, so it would have, wouldn't have applied at that time. So it hasn't ever applied at the course in the past because it's been run under a lease. So one of the things that, that's been, was missing in the memo is um, some kind of a numbers that cost estimate or price hourly wage estimate under prevailing wage or under uh, some other wage scheme. What are we talking about? Well, they certainly would, are required to pay minimum wage for all of it, anybody who would work there at a very minimum. Um, the prevailing wage for, um, and many of their employees, their full-time employees would exceed and they get benefits as well. So a lot of their full-time employees would exceed the requirement anyway. Um, so it's really the part-time seasonal employees um, and the prevailing wage positions, that's related mostly to maintenance. The people who work in maintenance would receive the prevailing wages, but anybody else who worked at the course in the pro shop or in the restaurant would be subject to the living wage. So if there was no living wage requirement, they would might default something closer to the minimum wage for these? Some employees would, some, it, it just depends on the position and what they're doing. Okay, Terry? Yeah, uh, why did we decide to go with a management company as opposed to a lease? Because this, is, this memo is the first time I've heard that we're changing the way we were doing this, which, so it kind of, came, yeah. kind of well, came as a big surprise. This is the way that most courses are going. Most people do not want to lease, uh, lease a golf course anymore, which is why Mel Fish and Lake Padden LLC is, are no longer going to lease the course. This really, and I want to talk, I want to say another reason why we picked this and why this is a, a better partnership for cities. It really gets us more involved in um, managing our golf course. And one of the things in their proposal that we asked for is how can you make the golf course more available to the general public, people who don't golf? And they do that at a lot of their other courses by working with their parks and recreation departments. So for example, Cedar Crest Golf Course on Saturday had a high school cross country run. So it opens up the course for more uses as well. So it's just, it's, it's the trend in the golf industry now, especially for municipal golf courses for management, a management contract versus a lease. Pinky. Uh, Leslie, uh, I'm, I'm curious about something because, and again, I'm just doing this from memory, but I thought that last year we had to put extra money in the budget to cover losses at the golf course. And this says that we are not putting any funding in there. No, not maybe the cemetery, not the golf course. We have a balance of about $300,000, I think, in the golf fund right now. So. so it completely pays for itself. Mm -hmm. There was some capital spending that we've had to do, which is our responsibility and would still be our responsibility. Uh, all the capital so far has been paid for by the golf course. We took out, we loaned uh, money, borrowed money from I think the sewer fund about 15 years ago and remodeled the clubhouse. That was paid back with golf revenue and that has been paid off now. Dan? sort of a two-part question. Um, what is the monthly management fee that the city pays to Premier and what is the anticipated monthly or annual revenue? The golf course uh, right now, the total operating uh, cost of the golf course under the current is around 1.2 million. So that includes all of the revenue and expenses under the current contract. Um, and with round staying, I, you know, it would probably be about that same amount, but it, it's hard to tell. So we would, we would collect all the revenue and then we would turn around and pay them back for their direct expenses plus a management fee of about $8,000 a month. 
And in these other cities that are doing that, they are doing that same thing, plus realizing a profit. So more money is coming in than, than is going out. Okay, thanks. Gene? Yeah, one of the last things I want to see, and, and I'm glad this is coming forward, is that we have to run that thing again. I've been through that, and it costs the general fund a lot of money. We've been very fortunate to have Mel and that gang out there for a long time running. It hasn't cost us a dime. And for us to have to go back, so I'm inclined to go along with this. I was a very strong supporter with Terry of the living wage ordinance. We went through a lot of hell to get that passed. Mm -hmm. But in this case, it being a, a golf course where there's different, um, different job titles and everything, I, I'm, I'm willing to do it because in three months, if this doesn't go through, where are we at then? We'd be running it or we wouldn't be running it and we'd have a beautiful golf course sitting there deteriorating because we can't afford to run it. And that's one thing that if we don't have an avenue like this, that'll be another discussion down the road. So I'm kind of inclined to go along with this one-time exemption. April? Um, do you think we would have had a different response had we said that we were going to do that from the beginning? Because it seems like some people if maybe didn't apply for... Uh, we Oh, I'm sorry. No, I, because of Premier, we're saying that we've already selected them and then we're going to make this this change. Do you do you think it would have made a difference in, in the You mean if we, we had advertised the RFP out, that way? Done it? Yeah. We, uh, we, the RFP was wide open. We said we would accept proposals for management or lease. We only got four responses. And Premier has the best experience. They're successful. They have a tremendous marketing plan. Their full-time employees get fabulous benefits. I would say um, pretty comparable to what City of Bellingham employees get for their full-time employ employees. They have a 401k program, uh, health benefits, employee assistance program. So uh, they're they're a very successful, good company. And, and I I should point out that Bill Schickler, president of the company, is is here today. Um, they have a small um, core team that runs the golf course, runs the courses, so they hire employees. They will offer employment to all of the employees that currently work at the golf course, so they would keep them on. And they will do everything for us. We're not going to be out there running the course, but they do it in conjunction with us. So we work on a budget together. We work on um, uh, needed improvements together. So it's really a better partnership than a lessee, which tends to set up a little more of an adversarial Peter, can relationship. You give the, for those that weren't here, oh, sorry. Probably Alan. Or Alan, yeah, for the living wage ordinance, can you just give a brief overview so people understand what it is that we'd be saying we're, we're going to forgive for this particular thing? Well, the the, the living wage ordinance was adopted, I think, in 2002 or 2003. It's actually before my time. And we had some fair, we've had some fairly extensive discussions with Premier. And just uh, last week, we realized, oh, my gosh, we think that the, we had to work through the prevailing wage issue. And then we realized maybe, the, well, the living wage ordinance also applies. Um, and what that does is that set back in 2003 some uh, prevail, uh, living wage amounts that are increased annually, I think based on some cost of living or inflation rate. So the, the, the living wage goes up every year. And what's happened is uh, just recently is the living wage has surpassed the um, prevailing wage, which is the prevailing wage in Whatcom County set by the, determined by the state, which is usually at the, at the wage everybody's earning or slightly higher. Um, and, and so that's what's created the problem. We now have not only prevailing wage under state law, but we have the living wage because, uh, as we all know, the, the wages across Whatcom County, across the country, have been fairly stagnant, but the living wage just continues to rise. So I think it will be an issue. It's the first time our office has had to deal with it since I've been here 14 years. I think it will become more and more of an issue because of that difference. I don't know if that answers your question. And the, the living wages are now, uh, the living wages, um, there's uh, $13.06 with health, health benefits and $15.04 without. 
Terry? Yeah, this was originally established with, uh, because of the recognition that wages in Bellingham have been depressed for a long time. And back then we knew that they were being depressed. This is a great place to live, that should be enough wage. So it was established with the recognition that the city should be a model provider instead of trying to undercut wages but and with the understanding that we the city was moving more towards contracting out of services that compete against the city's workforce and wanting to establish the idea and the model that we should be paying a living wage for people doing you know a, a, a work and so that was the basis for when it was put in place. And so just for the, some history with it. Yeah. Yeah. So that would mean um, they wouldn't, if, if the council passed this, they wouldn't be paying the, the living wage, but they would still have to pay prevailing wage for Correct. their employees. So and unfortunately, this is added to our packet, and I don't have the agenda bill. What, what is the um, action that staff is seeking or authorization? Well, we do need, under the living wage ordinance, we do need a, uh, a written finding by council, which I think uh, Peter and I have talked about it, that the minutes can reflect the motion and the vote on the motion. But we would need a motion to exempt the city contract to manage, operate, and maintain the Lake Padden golf course from the city's living wage ordinance because either the ordinance will cause economic hardship to the city and its citizens, or the exemption is in the best interest of the city due to special circumstances. And I want to emphasize, uh, just want to emphasize one other thing is, the city's golf course has been intended to provide an affordable golfing experience for city residents, mm -hmm. residents and we've uh, tried to keep green fees low. In fact, I think council has to approve green fee increases. So you're in this bind of uh, trying to compete with other private golf courses, uh, trying to keep the, green, the fees lower, but if you have to pay the living wage, you're, you have higher expenses and less income. So it becomes very difficult to make this uh, 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 an operation that's self-sufficient because you're getting pressed both on paying higher wages than everybody else that's providing golf services in the county, but you're charging less to do it. Peter? <coughs> yeah. Um, in the spirit of offering potential rationales for this too, there's those that Alan mentioned too, but one thing to think about is, and maybe maybe it's unique, maybe it's not, but so there are there are other golf courses, there are other employees of other golf courses that won't be earning the same wage by definition. They're earning the prevailing wage because by definition the prevailing wage is conducted, you know, figured out by the state by an industrial statistician. So what you could have is individuals, same job, same duties, they could actually be paying taxes to the city of Bellingham, subsidizing someone who's actually earning more than them for doing the same job. So that's another rationale that you could factor into your, your thinking on this. Gene and then Roxanne. Let me take a crack at it. Alan's motion sounded pretty good, but let me just move to grant an exemption to the living wage ordinance for the city contract to Premier Golf Centers LLC in whatever language Alan has there. Second. <laughs> oh, okay, so we have a second. Roxanne? Yeah. That would, um, go ahead. So with my work down in Pierce County, one of the things I fought for was the development of the Chambers Bay Golf Course. And so I think it's interesting then that I'm still talking about golf. <laughs> uh, but I really want to support this, especially because I'm thinking about the people where this golf course means a lot to their day. Uh, it means a lot to their quality of life, and I don't want to impact that in any way, especially for all the quality of life it's brought to Pierce County and it brings to our community. And so I don't know, maybe the universe is also trying to tell me I should be one of those new people picking up the sport of golf. So maybe I'll give that a try and I'll support this. April and then Terry. Um, one, do we have to have the, I, just, I still have a lot of information I need to like take in. So if this isn't like, has to happen today, if it can happen at our next meeting, I would appreciate a little bit more time to fully understand. I have that question and I have a follow up. Yes, our, our problem, and I, I, I know that Leslie feels it more than I do, but we have less than three months 
to negotiate a contract with Premier or somebody else. Uh, we need to also purchase and or lease all the equipment necessary to run the golf course, and we have to transition between Mel's um, company and the new operator. And even if even if we start today, doing completing all that by January 1st is is going to be a pretty significant effort. So uh, that's why we did the special set. Uh, of this, uh, you know, missing the uh, regular agenda bill packet because time is of the essence to get everything done. And um, this is going to seem like a really odd question, but especially if people are only making prevailing wage and it's out of pattern, is there even a bus that makes it all the way out there? So if somebody can't afford to have a car, they can at least yes, get a job Yes, there is a bus that? that drops off right in front of the golf course. I've seen people bring their clubs on the bus. Oh, that's great. Terry? Yeah, I'm it's kind of feeling like April because somehow maybe we got an email but I didn't see it and this is the first I saw of it so I'm you know I want to see the golf course work I've heard from a lot of golfers and I know how important it is but I'm gonna end up abstaining because this is the first I saw of it and I need this is something I got to process before I'd make a decision on it so I'm gonna abstain from it if, because I, yeah, was, I should have, it's not, it wasn't in the packet, so he didn't see it there. When I looked on the computer, it wasn't there initially, and so maybe it came, but I didn't, you somehow know, I, I missed it. When it was but, added late, I, I, I did make a special request that uh, council members be emailed the information ahead of time. I, I knew it wasn't going to yeah. get to you in the so usual I, so way. So I'm, I'm not going to support it. Not because I don't want to see that going, but I need information ahead of time to think about changes like this. Dan? Um, Leslie, you mentioned the 1.2 million uh, annually. That's, that's the total um, revenue generated from the golf course pri uh, gross prior to expenses. Is that correct? That's what we've got. Oh, I'm sorry. That's what we have gotten from Lake Padden LLC. They have to submit a report to us every year of their total revenue. Okay. So I'm kind of a numbers person, and this really, um, this doesn't have anything, this isn't my budget in it. It's just a narrative, and um, it's challenging because I want to understand what the, at the end of the day, what what is the city, what's the benefit to the city, and how much does it look like? and you know, there are other mitigating factors. You know, if the if um, Premier has you know a really good marketing plan that could increase um, um, the use of the of the facility, uh, but there but there's really nothing in here that uh, that indicates what that would look like. Um, so I, I'm just really having a hard time understanding the, the numbers component of it, what the what the net to the city would look like. Yeah, I and I I. I apologize that we don't have that information because this just came up so late, but we felt compelled that we needed to get this to council right of way because time is of the essence to really make a decision here if we're going to be able to do this or not. So I would say basically you're looking at about $3, 2 to $3 an hour for, because some of these employees are not going to have benefits if they're part-time seasonal employees, college, a lot of college kids are people who get these kinds of jobs at golf courses in the summertime, either um, working in food and beverage or uh, washing golf carts, things like that. So these are not, um, these are not family type of jobs. The full-time employees do get good benefits, but it's similar to our own uh, I, employees, say, at the swimming pool, for example, that are part-time, they're going to college, this is, these are good jobs for them, but the additional amount that we would have to pay per hour over the course of the year could add up substantially. Um, I know, for example, for the four golf courses in Seattle, when Seattle went to the minimum wage of $15 an hour, it cost an additional $680,000 a year to meet those wages. So it's, it's, not, a, it's not a small amount of money. April and then Jean. Yeah, I'm, I'm with Terry on this one. I, I, uh, I need more time. I'm with Dan in the sense of I want to know, who, so who's good, 
if it comes off the backs of whoever takes that job, then who's going to be benefiting from that? Is it that the, the golfers who golf will have a more subsidized experience and maybe that's worth it? Is it that we won't be bringing it out of our general fund? I just need to know at the expense of that. And I don't, you know, the council, I wasn't on it, but they felt like it was important enough to pass this. And, and before we start just not, not, not using it now and then using it then, I'd almost rather go back and look at it because it sounds like it'll probably come up again and again and make sure it's still fitting fluidly in an ordinance of today and if it's something that we still even want to have on the books. So I, I need to go back and understand it a little bit better. I need to talk with some of you a little bit more and then I really need to understand okay, so that money's not going to those people because unfortunately what's happening now is there's, you know, single parents are competing for those college jobs that used to be, you know, summer employment. So I have a feeling we are going to see people who aren't your traditional students coming down and working in the summer golf course. So um, I just don't have enough information. I really want to support what's going on. I've heard wonderful things about this, and I know the, the parks commission has been working at this and um, several members on that committee. I just to make a, a responsible decision in this moment, I don't have enough information. And so I'm sorry to pull that back because it sounds like you have a deadline. I feel like within about two weeks I could I could definitely understand it better, but it doesn't sound like I'm going to get the information I need as far as finances and stuff before then. Jean? Uh, this is one of those emergency situations that uh, is the, and I understand, I know why they're coming forward. I, I know this is not easy for them to bring this forward and ask for this, but Everything we do, everything we pass, you know, there's exemptions to a lot of things. But the biggest crisis we're going to have is if, if we don't do this and do it soon, is we're going to be looking at a hole in our budget next year that will be larger than you've seen before if we have to run that golf course, fund that golf course, and raise prices and lose money. That's what's going to happen. And I'm happy that this is a company that does this and they're professionals and they do it. Like I said before, Mel did a great job and, and he wants out, so now we're looking at this. but. I think we need to move forward and, and do this today for the simple fact that um, if we don't and we delay any longer and we end up with that golf course in our lap, I just don't want to see that because I don't think that will be a good thing for the taxpayers of Bellingham if that happens. And, and it could be the loss of not running the golf course too and letting it sit there. That would be even worse. So I'm confident that the staff has done their homework on this. And this is in the best interest of the city, and that's what our jobs are up here, the best financial interests of the city. So that's why I'll support it. So there is a motion before us uh, in the Committee of the Whole. Uh, if we do take action, it would be finalized tonight. Are we ready to take a vote this afternoon, or do we want to take some other course of action? Well, I just, I guess the mayor could help. Do, do you see this impacting our budget if we weren't to pass it, or do you, I mean, if yes. we didn't do it at this very moment? It's pretty, <laughs> I mean, you and Gene have far more the, experience. This is a but. conversation that's gone on for a long time about how we manage the assets that we have, whether they're a swimming pool, a cemetery, a golf course, an ice rink, a museum, a, a theater, and we're trying to focus our resources and our energies on the things that nobody else can do for us. And in this particular case, somebody else can do this as well or better than we could. And so what I see is um, an exception that we're asking. We're not asking to repeal the living wage ordinance. I think it's, it would be wonderful, since it was passed in 2002, to look and see, as Terry said, Okay, we have a reason to do it, and it, it, the balance of what it is now has changed between the prevailing wage and the living wage ordinance. The prevailing wage is based on market conditions and a chart, and the living wage is based on a desire to pay the people in our community the best we can. So I would say that I would appeal to you to pass this exemption today and continue to have the conversation because this is – this is one exemption not dealing with city employees or, or anything else that I think will allow us to have a better discussion as we move forward. I don't know, April, what we're going to tell you in two weeks <coughs> that you don't know now. I mean, it, it, it was a little bit of a shock to me, too. So it isn't like we were all running up here to, to do this. It was an unforeseen 
wrinkle that we didn't know about before. So I apologize to all of you that you don't have more information and more time. I understand if anyone's reluctant to vote for it, but I'm just saying it will, it will impact our budget if we don't have a contract. I'm not saying we won't have a contract, but we might not have a contract with this particular um, manager. So, Alan, I have a question. Uh, first of all, I'm, what, I, what I hear about Premier Golf Center's LLC sounds really good. They run 11 municipal golf courses already. They're going to bring some expertise, and I'm really, I really like that. Um, the question to you, though, is do we have to provide a blanket waiver, or the memo refers to the seasonal and part-time employees. Those are the ones who are actually going to be affected. Do, is it just like a, a total exemption, or would we waive it for certain seasonal or part-time employees, the ones that would actually be affected? I, you know what I'm saying? I'm trying to like preserve the principle of the living wage and only, you know, yield where we're talking about certain entry level positions that maybe are well well compensated or typically compensated at the at the prevailing wage level. Well, as, as Leslie said, that most of the full time um, year round employees will be making more than the prevailing wage and probably with if you they have benefits, health benefits and retirement benefits, they would uh, be above the um, living wage. Um, so I think we are talking about the seasonal uh, full-time, because it doesn't apply to part-time, seasonal mm -hmm. um, full-time employees, which you know one can argue as to who those people are. But what we're trying to do is not, I mean, you could, try to tailor it, but um, then that's one more thing that has to be tracked in addition to the living wage uh, for you know each employee. Okay, I think I'd like to try to move this along with Pinky. What do you have to say? I just had a quick question. How long is this contract for? Well, that is to be negotiated, but uh, probably no more than five years within a renewal. And we also would include a clause that we can, either party can uh, opt out with um, notice earlier. If it's not working for us, then we could opt out earlier, but probably no more than five years, four or five years. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have a motion before us, um, which is to recommend approving a waiver of um, the living wage requirement in favor of the prevailing wage requirement on the contract with Premier Golf Centers. Any further discussion? Um, I'm hoping that maybe we can get a little bit more financial information by tonight just on the golf operations. Um, I'm going to vote yes and move this along um, for this evening when we'll take the final vote. Um, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? Abstaining. Okay. Abstain. Okay, that passes four to three. Uh, with three abstentions, I'll bring it forward with I'll call mixed recommendation tonight. Thank you very much. We'll go on to the... Next item on the agenda. This is a presentation of the mid-biennial adjustments for the 2017-2018 budget. Uh, the Honorable Mayor Kelly Linville will present the proposed budget changes for the 2017-2018 biennial budget. The proposed changes are increases in, increases in spending in the following departments, fire, library, parks, recreation, planning, community development, police, and public works. A little quiet, please. Um, yeah, we are going to hear this uh, budget presentation. Um, then we are going to come back to the budget issue in our work session, but between this presentation and our work session, we're going to do regular business, which is approval of minutes and items that are old and new. So it'll be a little bit funny. And when we adjourn to the work session again, that will be in the mayor's boardroom. This presentation, however, will be here in council chambers. Actually, uh, Kelly or Brian, which one wants to start? Mayor Kelly. Brian? <laughs> I have to ask him. You're the boss. Okay, I apologize for my voice ahead of time. Um, first of all, it's my pleasure to present these budget adjustments to you. Uh, I need to compliment the council, um, obviously in our staff, but our council especially on their willingness to look at the biennial budget um, process, which allows our staff more time to actually get their work done 
and secondly, understand that the midterm adjustments are not rewrites of the biennial budget. They're adjustments to either add things that <clears throat> are essential or to just make adjustments in the bottom lines as we're coming forward. So um, the guidance that we gave to the departments were just that. Uh, we're not asking for a bunch of new initiatives. We're asking for you to look at your biennial budget amount and see if you can manage that till the end of 2018. So um, these are the four areas where we have added resources, public safety, environment, social services, and economic development. Okay, let's start with public safety. Um, we have spent an inordinate amount of time and energy and money in cleaning up the homeless camps. And what the result has been is that we have taken park staff, public works staff, and police staff away from their regular duties. And uh, I, and, and it was, well, there were a lot of reasons why we looked at, should we have someone that can do this so people can go back and do their regular jobs with the city. And it was my, it is my recommendation that we do do that. Um, this individual, a homeless coordinator, will be supervising the cleanup for the homeless camps. And then because they will be a compliance officer, they will also be able to do other compliance activities wh which builds our capacity to enforce the laws of the, of the city. Um, the, that's $85,000 general fund, and then the funds for the camp cleanup, uh, $300,000 non-general funds to deal with the cleaning up of the camp itself. So not the operations, but the cleaning up. Um, we are investing in a new ladder truck, $1.5 million general fund. The vehicle that we're replacing is 19 years old, the life expectancy of a fire truck is 15 years. Um, and so I feel comfortable that um, we're gonna need that kind of replacement into the future. We're also uh, attempting to get fire on the same kind of re vehicle replacement schedule as everyone else. So while we won't be paying ahead for vehicles, um, we will be p paying for them over time and this is an investment to be able to do that. Um, bunker gear for firefighters also, we have um, put in $65,000 general fund for bunker gear. Uh, there was a request for 78 um, sets. We bought 56 sets in 2016-17 and we put money in for another 28 and uh, the Fire Chief has assured me that there are no safety issues with this, but there would be some inefficiencies because sometimes people would have to work overtime. But we are gonna to continue to invest in the safety of our firefighters and we'll be making other investments um, in future years to make sure that every firefighter has two, um, two sets of bunker gear so they don't have to stay off duty if one of them isn't washed. Um, body worn pr uh, program technician. We get a lot of public uh, records requests, as you can imagine. We are very progressive in using body worn cameras, which I'm pleased about, but it takes some effort to organize that information so that we can re uh, respond to the public requests that we get. So that's what this $85,000 will be doing is organizing our, our videos. Um, and then distracted driving is a grant, $63,000. And uh, the dispatch capacity, we have not hired uh, any dispatchers since 2007. And obviously our population's grown, our incidents have grown. And so uh, I did recommend those two positions in our budget. They do have to be approved by WATCOM. So that will be something that Terry and I will be dealing with in, at our next meeting. But I thought I would rather be safe than sorry and put them in here so that we make sure that we have the right number, amount of staffing at our 911 centers. Environment, um, 
we have seven hundred and sixty thousand dollar grant for funding the solar investment uh, on city facilities. Public Works will pay a matching two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. We are finalizing the location. I thought at one time it was finalized, but now we have to finalize it again. So that will be uh, as soon as we know exactly where it's going to be. We'll let you know. I know Pinky's. Um, anxious to know where those solar panels are going to be. Me too. Uh, planning and permitting, uh, we got a Paul Allen Foundation grant for $2.9 million to help with the Nooksack, removing <coughs> uh, the Nooksack Diversion Dam. Um, it will pay for planning, permitting, and some construction, and in the end it will aid in our salmon recovery because it will allow better spawning passage for our salmon. Um, the council has talked for several years about uh, energy, a position to look at energy. We've been ha had a very successful relationship with sustainable connections over time, and now we're at the point where we think that it's justified to have an in-house employee that's doing that work, so I know that'll make some of you happy. Um, the cost is a little bit higher because there's a, a $40,000 car al um, allowance in there. And then the residential waste study. We talked a lot about what do we do with our waste when we talked about the change from incineration to digestion at the sewer treatment plant. Um, we need to determine in our community what is the next best place to reduce our waste. And I could guess what it is, but I'm not going to, so we're going to do this assessment so we can know. Um, we'll use the determination uh, to look at our education and outreach uh, activities. And then just for your information, out of our citizens that sign up for garbage, um, only 6,200, excuse me, only 6,200 use Food Plus. And that's probably one of the areas where we'll see an opportunity for increased recycling. Okay, social and other services. The GRACE program. Dan, what is the GRACE program? It's crowd level response and coordinated engagement. Thank you. I just call it GRACE. Um, we have $140,000 general fund in the budget. 92 is existing this year that was given to the Whatcom Alliance for Healthcare Accessibility Achievement. They changed the name. Advancement. All right. And, uh, and so there, there is another 47,500 that the city is going to put in. Uh, the county will be putting out an RFP, so we'll have a county city partnership for this to go forward, which I'm extremely excited about. And of course, Dan knows way more about this than I do. So if you have questions about the program, uh, there was a thought at one point in time, we wouldn't have to put any extra money in, additional money, but that didn't seem to work out. So we are, because what this, uh, what this program is going to do is so value, will be so valuable to our community. So. Uh, drop-in center, another $21,000 in the drop-in center, and Tara's sick today, so I can't tell you exactly what it's for. Do you know, Brad? These were for those improvements that you see on the outside on Holly Street so that they can congregate off the sidewalks a little bit more that are already in and done. This is just a budget for them. Oh, this is make us accountable. Is, so for, it, now we have to for the public, when we say drop-in center, this has to do with a, a day facility for homeless individuals. Uh, and okay. right now it's in a temporary place, and these are improvements to make it work better. Correct. Um, the, our new librarian, Nancy, has done a great job of demonstrating to me the facts about how our circulation is not keeping up with what it should. We used to have more materials to circulate than the county library system and more people using the library, that's flipped now. So um, I made a commitment to the library that we would look at what it would take them to get up to the level that they need to be for their materials. And um, this is the first installment, so $109,000 general fund. 
the parks investments all come from other funds. Excuse so me, non uh, Kelly, I'm sorry, we had a question? Oh. Uh, Kelly, I just had a quick question about the library. In our packet here, it said that um, we were going to remove the contract with Whatcom County Library System. Did I read that right? So, so for that number, I don't Yeah, I it's not for that number. Here. So in addition to that, there's loss of revenue of the 152000 So as the mayor was speaking to in the past, the county li library um, used the analysis that there was more people from the county using um, the, the library in total, libraries in totals, because it really is operating in partnership as one um, library. So you can go in and get a card, you can go in and borrow books and return books anywhere. So historically, more of the city used more of the resources countywide as the library. Recently, that has flipped. So if you may recall, last year um, we first got notice from the county that they thought that the statistics need to be looked at in the contract um, reviewed, which we did, and we took out that payment from them in 2017. This is to remove it in 2018 because we have determined that those statistics no longer hold true for what they were originally paying for. So going forward, um, we will no longer get monetary compensation for that statistical analysis that was done. Um, and so it's just, it, it was just time to review the contract and that's the results. The, the administrative contract, the, the cooperation that we do between the Bellingham Library and the Whatcom County Library, we're not changing that. This is the obligation they had to pay us for materials that they were using of ours, which now we've determined they're not using. There, there is a lot of cooperation and sharing and some compensation. It's just that that one is no longer valid. It was one of those historical things. Um, park investments, these are all non-general fund, uh, $3 million for Cordata Park, plan for the Squalicum Pier, $500,000, uh, organize and increase park maintenance. I think this year with the pass, or last year with the passage of Greenways, we prioritized something we weren't doing, which is we weren't maintaining um, our parks as well as we could, the ones we already have that people are using. And so we're hiring people to do that. And that we have sewer upgrades at Lake Padden. So when we talk about the cost of Lake Padden, these are the kind of things that we're talking about. So this is half a million dollars. We have another question from Pinky. <laughs> uh, okay, Pinky. Kelly, <laughs> uh, quick question on the um, park maintenance staff, which I support. Does that include, like we redid a lot of things down Holly Street and now there's lots of plants and all of those other things. Does that include, is that under parks maintenance or is that under public works? I think that's under our private contract or public works. No, that's under um, parks. So, well, yes. Holly, Holly Street or in Marine Park, sorry, I, I should clarify that. Well, Holly Street. We're all the, you know, oh, we redid all the sidewalks yeah. down Holly Street and there's plants now on a lot of our yeah. downtown areas and I'm just wondering if that is helping to maintain those sorry, particular yeah. areas. That is streets, so that is public works. The street right of ways and all the rain gardens is, is streets. Sometimes I'm right, I don't know. Every now and then. Okay, um, economic development, as you know, this was the number three priority for our uh, community survey. Um, we are partnering, which I love, with the Downtown Bellingham Partnership uh, <coughs> to do a retail strategy and hire someone to implement that strategy. Uh, our city share is $25,000 and the, the Downtown Bellingham Partnership will be the employer of the recruiter and will pay the balance of the money it costs to have that service. And I feel more comfortable having them have the employee because this is basically looking at helping downtown businesses, not businesses necessarily citywide. And I, I just think it's great that the Downtown Partnership, because that's who they represent, would take this on. Um, the, the good news is we have lots of hotels and motels and they're generating more money. So we have more tourism grants. So that's where that money comes from, hotel and motel tax. Um, the only continuing, well, continuing this year um, capital projects we're highlighting are 
the completion of the federal building, uh, $400,000 in non-general funds. Um, we have spent $8.5 million so far on that dollar investment. I love those dollar investments, but it's a beautiful building and it's an asset for our community and it definitely <laughs> allows our employees to help repopulate downtown. So I think it's, it's, a, very, it's a very good thing. Um, the full cost, uh, this will be 4.5 for the city money and 4 million in grants. So we do get grant money to do some of this. And the full cost of doing everything that the historical assessment said we should do on the federal building was like $20 million. So what we're doing now is we're doing the things that make the building attractive and usable and more consumer friendly, um, but we have not about budgeted $20 million yet, unless Brian didn't tell me. Um, we've had some pipe breakages this year, as you all know, living in certain neighborhoods, and this is the $2 million to pay for those repairs. Okay, the um, FTEs. We're actually adding FTEs. We, I think this is the most FTEs we've added since I've been mayor. And I feel like they are being added in focus priority areas where we need more resources. So obviously the parks maintenance people are one. Uh, the cleanup coordinator, the technician for body worn cameras, uh, custodial ma maintenance worker, building engineer and uh, accounting assistant and then the one police dispatch for WATCOM and the two for fire that WATCOM will be approving or not. That will be up to them. Budget changes. Brian, I'm going to let you go over this, the, the um, balance sheet, please. All right. So <coughs> this slide shows you the uh, mid biennium changes that are being proposed to you today. Uh, the biennium budget for the general fund, uh, sorry, is $159 million before these changes. There's $2.1 million of general fund changes, um, which would take the biennial budget up to a total of $161.3 million for the two years. And you can see the totals there for the other funds, um, the 11 uh, million seven hundred twenty eight thousand dollars of proposed additions a lot of that is capital obviously for the other funds um, so you see a total two-year budget of five hundred eighty two um, just under five hundred eighty three million dollars for the biennium budget and those general uh, non-general funds the reason I divided them out that way is so you could see what the flexible money was which are the general funds and then the dedicated funds which are the other funds so we're, the majority of the changes have to do with money that cannot be spent in the, in the general fund budget. Go ahead, Brian. And then uh, the next slide just shows you um, the planned use of, of re reserves. So um, right now the uh, forecasted revenues for the biennial budget again is $155.3 million. Um, with the net changes, we are seeing a little bit of an increase in um, sales tax and B&O tax that is ahead of budget, but we're also seeing lines and then, as we mentioned, the library change where we have some corrections that are coming out of revenues. So we've chosen not to increase revenues right now um, for the next, uh, you know, 12 months of next year plus the remaining three months of this year. But we're using reserves for a lot of the one-time um, purchases and that balance of $6 million in the general fund. Um, there's $49 million of use of reserves in all other funds. That includes some funding. So last time I was in front of you, we spoke about the state's capital budget that is still not approved. So we had a $12 million loan. Right now that loan is, not, is on hold along with some of the capital funding grants that we would normally get. So we're cash flowing that out of reserves until we know either that that's going to go forward or that we determine that we're going to have to borrow money from another source. But right now we're doing fine on the use of reserves. So this is just a summary. And again, I want to point out this assumes both the revenue forecast all the way out till the 2018 and expenditure 
revenue forecast and expense all the way out to 2018. So we've got a lot of years left, year plus to go, and that's why we're conservatively using the reserves at this point. Any money that comes in that we either don't spend between now and the end of the year or revenues that come in over budget, we use to decrease the use of reserve and add to the reserves at the end of that time period. And just to rest assured, we have our 12 percent mandatory budget reserves and then you want to clarify what we have in the unrestricted reserves. Yeah, so if, if we in fact used all six million dollars of reserve, we would have seven million dollars of undesignated reserves at the end of 2018, so in the general fund. That's above our 12 percent reserve number. So seven million dollars is six, six weeks of general fund expenditures approximately. And that, and that what I feel comfortable with that because I know that we we could have a zero balanced budget, but I think it's fair to look at the way the revenues are coming in and how we're spending the money rather than just artificially pay things out of reserves that are ongoing costs. Okay, so okay, I think that's. That's it. We'll open up for a general discussion right now, and then we will adjourn for the work session. So go ahead, April. Will you help recall my memory, and it might be Chief Hewitt, but right at the end after we did our budget meetings last time, we came in, and the next meeting we were asked to approve, I thought it was $950,000 for a fire truck, and now I see a ladder truck. And, and I remember approving it, and now I see $1.5 So is this a different ladder truck? The first, the first one is a fire truck. This is a ladder truck. So you're right. We approved a fire truck at the beginning of January of this year, and it's seven hundred fifty thousand um, dollars. And this is a ladder truck. Oh, so okay. we only have two ladder trucks, and there, we have yeah. In that fire trucks. Oh, in that discussion, we had we had talked about why it wasn't because you know how we have the fleet and people pay into the fleet, and so this I felt like that one was like oh this is just a, unexpected. We weren't seeing it, but now I see another one. So well, there are two interested. different kinds of, of vehicles, and this gets us, Brian, correct? This gets us where we want to, in the direction we want to go for fleet. We're not up to it paying for itself yet. They've but been paying into, just like all of our other departments do, paying into building have, your fleet? They haven't been. We've or been are you now? Borrowing. It, it, so, uh, Bill Hewitt with the fire department, and so no, we, the fire department has not been paying enough money into fleet replacement on a regular basis to replace the entirety of the fleet as it comes up. So, we, we do have three pieces of apparatus, two engines and a ladder truck that have all well exceeded their lifespan. And last year, you know, we've been working together to try and find a plan to get the needed replacements done. That was the, the one engine last year was the highest priority. We've got that on order. We're hoping it'll arrive here at the end of this year. And then the ladder truck was the next uh, priority in the things that needed to be replaced. So we're still working long term to uh, solve the fleet replacement problem. Um, but these are, as the mayor said, these are the steps that we're, we're taking immediately to ensure the safety of the city and, and still make sure we're doing good planning long term. Yeah. I just add, it's not just fire. So there's other vehicles that have not been paying in for a replacement. So when the budget was tight, um, we made the decision to pay in a reduced amount. And so we need to catch up. And this is two vehicles that are very expensive. And that's why it's, it's a bigger impact to the city's budget. But there are other vehicles and other departments that are also behind or paid less than 100%. So it'll be an ongoing thing. It's going to take time to do that. Um, but it's like deferred maintenance on our buildings. We um, defer maintenance when times are tight and we need to fix things like that and we're having to pay for stuff so the federal building um, but even this building you can see walking around the front patio that we're re replacing so all those things are deferred maintenance that are now being done Thank you. So Dan, we're, just oh, sorry. So we're, no, we're going in the right direction though I want you to know that we've acknowledged that that was not happening in the past and and we're fixing it Dan if a regional fire authority is successful, what happens to these assets? Like, what, who's, I, I would assume that if they become the property of the fire authority, that would make sense to me, but how does that work in terms of if we're paying for them? Uh, 
It, it gets spelled out in the plan document and we're still working through the planning process. Typically, the way the RCW indicates is unless otherwise specified in a plan, yeah, the assets of um, the fire department and the fire district would become assets of the regional fire authority. And, and again, though, whatever purchases um, go to continue to provide those essential services to the citizens, whether it's originally paid for through the city or through the fire district, it continues to service the same people. Terry? Yep. Next Monday, our session uh, for the regional fire district will be on, on assets and how we deal with, with, yes. with assets. So Michael and I and the mayor, we've been meeting every two weeks. Every Monday when the council's not meeting, we're meeting on, on that. And it's very complicated. So we are working through it and hopefully we, you know, we're making a lot of progress, but, it, but we're still that's a discussion that's on for this next meeting. Yep. Okay, again, um, this is kind of general discussion at this point. We will be adjourning for a work session. Is there any more general discussion we'd like to do at this point? Okay, so we're going to first approve minutes, then do old new business, and then we'll do the adjournment. So uh, we have one set of meeting minutes to approve. Thank you very much, Kelly. We have one set of meeting minutes from September 25th, 2017. Move approval. Second. Second. Are there any changes or corrections to the meeting minutes of September 15th? All those in favor of approval signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> meeting minutes are approved. Items that are in old and new business. Terry. Yeah, I have one. Uh, this relates to something specific to my district. And uh, those that live in areas that have parking permits received a notice that the parking districts, they'll no longer get a sticker for their car that enforcement people will be able to recognize it. Well, one of the unintended consequences for me has been a whole lot of phone calls and people stopping by the house to, uh, concerned about this is that part of the enforcement is that people are able to recognize who's not supposed to be parking there by the parking stickers. We know who's parking where they're supposed to be because there's a sticker on it says you have permission or there's a guest sticker there but without those there's no way to for the neighborhood to know specifically who's not supposed to be there and so usually when that happens a lot they call the enforcement person and said hey these people are parking here every day can you do something about it and then they come out because they don't come by that real regular and so I would really like the administration to look into this because I've been getting a lot of flack on this and and I don't know how do we get around it maybe that was the intent so they don't call enforcement <laughs> and that but I don't think that's the intent I think it's an unintended consequence okay Eric Thank you, Mayor. I'm Eric Johnston with uh, the Public Works Department. So we are moving forward with a new management system for the parking system in an attempt to try to re reduce our costs uh, the, and of the operation of the parking system as a whole. That new system allows us to move forward with the park, the, excuse me, the enforcement by license plate system, which, which overall reduces the overall management of the parking system. And there's some quirks we need to work through, work through and that's one of the issues that we're going to be paying some attention to over the next couple of months. Overall, it'd be much easier for the entire system with the new management software system. It connects to the state licensing system. It connects to the officers in the field. It allows us to write tickets in the field you get to get mailed to you rather than the pieces of paper that go out through there. But the real benefit is going to be the license plate recognition. You can pay by your license plate rather than having to put quarters into the meters. It allows us to do more things that are clearly identified in our management strategy for parking systems overall. A couple of things that we need to spend some time on are related to the, the RPZs. Uh, as we try to minimize the cost Eric, to manage that, that's going to be a good thing. Uh, could you please explain briefly for the public what we mean by an RPZ and, yes, where, and where the RPZ is? <laughs> so, so the RPZ is a residential parking zone, and there are a couple of residential parking zones up around the university. Uh, they are... <clears throat> They are intended to allow for uh, residents to, to park on their street and not be imposed by uh, the students trying to park in front of somebody's house. Uh, we, we, we see a need to continue those, obviously. We'll try to find a way to make those as, as effective as we can. It is a free service. It's not, it's not charged for. So as we try to maintain the, the cost of that program, this is one avenue to help do that. We do recognize the need to make sure that residents know who's parking and not parking. 
Uh, overall, we, th we see it as a benefit and a more convenience to, to most c customers. Uh, we are getting questions about how do we expand the RPZs or diminish them in some places. There are some owners who want to see more of the RPZs, some who want to see less. Overall, we see a benefit to the system to making the change, uh, but we do see a challenge to have to address those individuals. How do you, individual interests of how do you recognize when somebody is legally parked or not. With the, with the, with the license plate recognition, uh, whereas before we kind of do it as a response, somebody calls and complains, the license plate recognition allows parking enforcement officers to be much more efficient and maybe broaden their expanded use of, uh, of enforcement rather than an on-call to make it more of a regular patrol. Terry, do you have more on that item? Well, just I just want you to know I'm lodging my complaint about this that for the RPZs, this has not been explained to neighborhood groups and others on how you're going to do that, how they can do that. Yes, overall, it's a good process, but it's going to impact dramatically my ward. Yes. And so uh, I just want you to know I'm, you know, we weren't asked about how this is going to work. We weren't told. Nobody's come out to neighborhood groups and said, well, here's how this can work, how you can do this. Yes, they'll be able to notify, but they don't come by very often. You know that. I do. I do. Yeah, they don't come by. They come by. I mean, they, it can go, you know, three, four weeks without somebody coming by. So I, unless somebody does call. So I, I really object to this because it hasn't been thought out for our neighborhood. Roxanne, you something on this topic? Just really quickly, I helped with the transition for the Public Works Department for the City of Tacoma with this, and what I did was I put information in little yellow tickets, little yellow envelopes that look like parking tickets, and put it under the, under the windshields. That helped tremendously with outreach. Everybody read it. Interesting idea. Oh, so are we through with that item? I lodge your complaint. I, I think Clearly you're, understood. Thank you're you. going to follow through. Uh, Pinky. Mayor, I'm wondering if you could get an update for us from the Natural Resources Committee on the Climate Action Plan. Um, we were supposed to see it in the spring of 2017 and then in August of 2017 and now we're in October. So um, this is pretty important to me and I think that it's very important to a lot of people who reach out to me in the environmental um, community and I'm wondering if they could give us uh, a deadline, a date when we will be seeing our climate action plan. I know that it's been, um, in, I've been informed that it will be before the end of the year. I know that's not very uh, satisfying, but I'm, I think, I think we had the discussion about the complexities of the way the report was written and and what we're doing now and what we're not going to do or what's not relevant. So I, and it was a very in long and complicated report. So no, I don't think anyone's trying to stonewall anyone. I just think that it ended up being uh, more difficult than they thought it would be. But um, I will check again with Ted unless, Eric, you know. I don't have a specific date. I know that Renee tasked me to get me her comments by the end of this week. So it's uh, forthcoming. Ted can get you a later date, a more specific date this evening for sure. <coughs> I guess my request on that is I don't think we want to see an absolutely finished document because there's going to be some policy questions. So whenever it's ready for the policy input, I think is when we want to see it, which may be before the final, final draft is ready. It should be before the final, final draft is ready. Okay, I have one item under old and new business. Um, we plan on having two town hall meetings this year, and we were supposed to be having the other one right about now. Things got busy. I didn't bring it up. I brought it up once, I think, two months ago. Are we still interested in doing another town hall meeting? If so, before the end of this year, and if so, what kind of topic? It was a lot of work, but it was a very successful endeavor. I think a lot of the work that's going on now in the planning committee, for example, that I think has been pretty successful, built off of the foundation with the public discussion that, that, and the town hall is part of that. So I'm still a big fan of the town halls, but right now we're in October and I'm looking for guidance and feedback from the council on this question. April? Well, I think we had done a verbal agreement that there was the library board wanted to potentially have a joint meeting with this council because they're going to have the library and I had brought it up anew and old and yeah. we kind of gave a head nod. Um, they're, we're doing that consultation plan. That should be coming back to us I think in November. I, you know, it, I didn't quite get a for sure from the library board of trustees now that that's changed a little bit if they still want to do a joint meeting, but that could potentially be uh, a joint meeting of boards that's not necessarily an open house, but something a little bit different than we typically do. 
Well, remember, the purpose behind the open houses really was to serve a larger purpose, as to just better communication, proactive communication with the public on significant issues. So, yeah. again, so, um, that's an idea. How does the rest of the council feel? What kind of direction uh, do you want to give to me? Can we have uh, two weeks to noodle on this and come back with some? Sure. Yeah. No, I'm sorry. I, I brought up once before, but not very forcefully. I just want to make sure that, you know, if we don't have time or if we want to push it off a little later, I'm okay with that. I just want to make sure that I brought it back up. It was kind of on your mind. Maybe we could bring proposals. Okay. So how about in, in two weeks we revisit this? If there's any other proposals besides this, different formats, same format, different topics. So uh, Brian just said that the feasibility study is going to be done. Brian Henrich, Mayor's Office. The, uh, the report on the library state will come back uh, the first meeting in November. I believe that's the 6th, Monday the 6th. And so one of the main issues there has to do with whether or not our library system in any way merges more deeply with the county's library system. Is that one of the major issues or the major that issue? That is one of the issues. It's looking at sustainable funding options that will be available to the city and to the library moving forward. So, But the mayor is just going to up their materials. That doesn't solve everything? Nope. <laughs> no. Okay. Can so I, anything else under old and new business? Can I make a suggestion? Oh, when you're done, can I make a suggestion? Anything else under old and new business? Okay. Kelly, go ahead then. Um, our staff reports for changes in the budget are very brief. Um, they're not going to take very long, and it's already 4:15. So I wanted to give you the opportunity of waiting until the 24th to hear this. You know, ask questions of staff. It'll give you a little bit more time to look at the budget and see what you'd like to ask. Right. If we seek oh, to schedule, we'll have all of 15 minutes before we would go into our scheduled executive session. So I guess you're saying, do we want to start our first budget work session this afternoon, or do we want to start our first budget work session maybe at a later meeting? Is that what you were? The next meeting. The I next mean, meeting. it's not going it, to. Your staff's already um, here. <laughs> okay. Uh, Roxanne? I know. My staff is already here. You're all excused. Could we do one for 15 minutes to start? Reducing the number of reports. I mean, I'm mm -hmm. You got 15 minutes. Well, let's go in. And we'll, okay. we'll do one. Let's go ahead and set. So, um, before everyone goes, uh, go ahead. We're, we're going to recess now to the mayor's boardroom for the, our first of our budget work <coughs> sessions. Uh, it'll be a little bit shorter than usual. We will then go immediately into executive session. Executive session for us, we have one item, which is a litigation matter. The litigation matter is Flint versus City of Bellingham. That will be approximately 10 minutes. That will scheduled at approximately 4.30, which means it should be over at approximately 4.40 or 4.45 when I will reconvene the regular city council meeting. We are now in recess.